So we are now going to be hearing from um, Priestess Devana Wolf of the Mount Shasta Goddess Temple. Priestess Devana is uh, my co-teacher in the Via Carmen Pythia program. We teach a two-year program with 22 different forms of divination and helping people build a business as a reader. Um, she has graduated from our priestess training. She is the consummate artist. She and her husband have a jewelry company called Forge and Fountain, and they make uh, precious and semi-precious stone jewelry with gold and silver. She is an artist who has designed not one but two oracle decks, the Incidental Tarot and a Curious Oracle. She um, creates, just recently has been creating statues out of clay. There's not one artistic form of expression that I've ever seen her not be able to do, basically. And she's also a beautiful writer. It's wonderful to have her here with us today. And her topic today is um, a survey of lion goddesses of the ancient world. So please warmly welcome Devana Wolf. Hello, everyone. So um, we're going to have a very, we're going to take a journey far across the Mediterranean, the Near East, and even parts of Asia. Today, we're, we're going to look at lion goddesses, lion iconography, and the general sort of archetypal power of the lion in these ancient cultures. Oh, I need my glasses. Hang on. <laughs> okay, I've got my trusty digital notepad here. <clears throat> so the first thing that I want to do is just kind of talk about the qualities of the lion as a symbol. Um, the lion is this kind of, <clears throat> it's a symbol, a powerful symbol across many different strata of our existence. So it's a, it can be a personal symbol, a political symbol, a spiritual symbol, and an archetype. So I'm going to throw out some of these qualities, and I invite you to also add to it. Just, you know, shout out. We'll do a little um, word, word banter here. So for personal lion qualities, strength, courage, confidence, and protection, any any uh, additions to that? Like, what do you think of the lion as a personal symbol to you? Playful. Playful. Authority. Authority. Absolutely. Personal authority. Loyalty. Loyalty. Interesting. Yes. Loyalty. Any others? Regal. Superb. Regal. So how one carries oneself superb Raw mother what sorry that what was that superb, superb mother superb mother know. yes powerful superb <clears throat> flawless mother i love that so those are great those are some really great like personal resonances for the there lion some in the chat the oh, sun let's see if i can get to the chat here you can get escape in the top left okay that and didn't work uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me help access the chat there we go okay great ah the sun fire agility and pride absolutely and maternal for the lioness, fierceness, loyalty, 
Excellent. Yes. These are all fantastic. And some of these focus and lineage. Thanks, Confidence. Vanessa. Confidence. Confidence. Absolutely. Some of these are going to translate as we kind of go up the strata. So now let's kind of look at this as a political uh, through a political lens, because the lion has been a symbol throughout known history of royalty, of heraldry, of houses, of nations. So it's the lion as a symbol of power is very prominent in the political sphere. Power, raw power, victory rulership royalty sovereignty and by sovereignty i mean national sovereignty you know the inability to be conquered and justice anyone have uh something to add looks like we also had teamwork and majesty in the chat mm -hmm. birthright birthright absolutely lineage birthright these are very powerful um concepts in historical kingship and the transfer of power relationship to the land and the natural world yes yes the relationship the power to the, land. the what, throne what? itself the throne yes. yes the act the actual throne and this is something that we're going to look at in the art because the lion this symbol of the lion has has different aspects in terms of the land the rulership and the spiritual authority yeah absolutely conquering colonialism um in the natural world the lion is the apex predator so it definitely like the shadow side of the lion symbolism is that dominating um destroying aspect that rowan mentioned this morning in the the destructive aspects bravery definitely bravery bravery in um in war warriors definitely would want to take on the strength and the power of the lion any others divine. divine ordinance so in other words the power of the gods has conferred leadership or authority upon you in the form of a lion okay big cats are also very loving and fun they're very playful so it's interesting that playful has come up a couple of times because in through the lens that we're looking at playfulness is is akin to freedom freedom from um judgment freedom from oppression and also freedom of expression freedom to be exactly what you are and in some ways that i call that quality wildness or untamedness, untamableness. That playfulness is the, the gentle, approachable side of it, but wildness is the true nature of the lion. <laughs> Molly says, yes, like the song Born Free. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, well, let's move up to the spiritual level because this is this is what most of the art we'll be looking at in the slideshow is referring to at least that's our that's our understanding of it not having a lot of rec written records to go with these um, images exaltation the lion as um in the physical world of the as the apex predator and the dominant force of its ecology is represents the highest level that you can reach so the lion is naturally associated with divinity 
with the heavens, with the stars. We have the constellation Leo. We have a lot of different interesting astrological um, depictions of lions and stars and planets and um, aspects that come up through these um, ancient worlds and up through the medieval and Renaissance worlds. I think part of that is uh, is that they dream. They spend a lot of time in dream time. So they're living between the worlds. They're in the liminal space. So they're getting a lot of um, other world information and connection. I love that. That actually touches on something that comes back to the wildness. It's, I think that in the earliest times when we see lions depicted in these ancient artifacts and forms of art, that it's a shamanic symbol, a totem. So um, Cosette mentioned in her in her um, presentation about the master of animals, master and mistress of animals um, is a common motif in in the ancient world, and it appears to be that these human figures have either a a a power relationship over these animals or um, a rulership in some way or the ability to tame them and to command them. So the lion as a shamanic symbol with the dreaming is very powerful. And I think that when, when we go into the slideshow, I'll mention kind of where that falls in. So exaltation to the heavens and with the divine realm. Celestial rule. So lions are often associated with the queen of heaven, with goddesses that confer divine rights, divine rights of kingship, divine rights of their people. So there's a sense of exaltation in the physical realm and exaltation in the celestial realm. The most, I think the most interesting aspect of lion in a, sphere, a spiritual um, sphere is this idea of the lion as a fighter of evil. And this is particularly explicit in the legends of Durga, Durga that um, Rowan first mentioned this morning. Durga is um, created in order to slay the demons that were plaguing the world. And she was given the vehicle of this lion in order to enact her power and her will upon the world. So there's this powerful, regal, brave, valiant, and just aspect to the lion that, um, I think also comes through later images up even into the heraldry of the medieval and later worlds. So any other spiritual qualities that you associate with the lion? Nobility, like not, I mean, not just nobility, like as in regal, but nobility as in of noble heart or of pure heart. Pure heart, yes. Protection. Perfection. Protection. Protection, yes, absolutely. Initiation. Initiation, yes. I God. think this also harkens back to that sort of divine ordinance initiation that the lion, either in itself or as um, as a messenger of the gods confers this power or initiation onto the worthy. The Dharma. The Dharma. The yes, the law, the, uh, the inherent law of existence. Peace keeps coming to me. Mm -hmm. Peace. The lion as, um, the lion's power as um, a maintainer of peace, a maintainer of the peace to quell rebellion, to quell discord. 
Interesting. Excellent. Yes, and then there's the whole relationship between the lion and the lamb, the peace and the wildness. Any more spiritual qualities? All right. Well, now, now I'm going to throw out some uh, archetypal qualities, and I, I hope that, you know, just chime on in. Wildness, untamableness, dominion, strength, ferocity, radiance, solar qualities, and by solar, the nurturing, healing fire of the celestial sphere any more freedom 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 absolutely freedom oh cosmic unity like what um rowan was saying about it can be everything is darkness or everything is lions <laughs> that's what happens when you go out from being on the earth where there's day and night into the universe where it's all dark but also all stars yes yes unity the oneness i think there's there's so many um overlapping kind of qualities here that we'll we'll see a lot of these layers as we go through the art okay so i'm going to go ahead and start our slides here ah back <laughs> okay lion goddesses of the ancient world so i'm starting in the mediterranean the arabian peninsula and syria so this is the realm east of egypt um, desert um, very harsh landscape but also very primal and uh, like you know these areas are the cradle of our known civilization. This is where we've traced the longest, the longest threads of our recorded history. So the pre-Islamic goddesses of the um, Arabian Peninsula, there is a trio that were considered daughters of Allah, Al-Lat, Manat, and Al-Uzza were sisters a lot is primarily she was the most widely worshipped and also the most um syncretized with neighboring cultures so you can see here in the first slide i, don't, I hope you can see it it's a little blurry up here oh did i move that can't quite see all of it um Allah is shown with a lion at her feet. She is enthroned, holding up one hand in blessing. And in another, it looks like either a sheaf of wheat or maybe an olive branch or, um, or a palm branch. So Allah was a very interesting figure. She was um, a goddess of fertility, of um, divine divine um provenance you can see in the center picture she's standing atop this lion with her two sisters and on the right in the far right photo you see this is the lion of palmyra this is from a lot's temp uh, temple in palmyra syria and you can see that the lion is uh protecting or cradling a gazelle between its paws and um this was a very particular quality of a lot in, in that at her temple bloodshed was strictly forbidden so the idea that this lion would be protecting its natural prey was a symbol and a warning to any invaders or you know any any people with ill intentions that the goddess would look very poorly upon violence and would exact revenge hmm. 
Let me go back to my notes. <laughs> so um, it's also thought that um, rather than daughters of Allah, that Allah was originally the the queen mother goddess of the era and that Allah was her consort and that he was pictured in the form of this lion so that when you see the images of Allah with the lion she is above it she is standing upon it or it is the guardian of her temple making sure that no one will commit violence in her in her vicinity or um under her name okay next okay so now we're gonna go north a little bit into mesopotamia and the levant so this is the area where the first writing was discovered or the first known writing mesopotamia sumeria canaan all of the um ancient biblical tribes came from this area so the primary goddess of um of mesopotamia was ishtar and or mostly interchangeable with inanna they were a uh, sovereign queen goddess um very very wide powerful cult in this era area and it's thought that inanna was either the the first known goddess of love and war or that her cult spread to all of these neighboring cultures influencing goddesses like aphrodite and um anahit anahita um even isis so what we have here is you, you can see in the first picture so this there's a little controversy over who this figure actually is i've heard a lot of different um theories some calling her lilith but mostly it's assumed to be ishtar you can see that she's winged and she has bird claw feet so there's an aspect to her that is um an ancient bird goddess she is standing atop two lions and on either side of the lions we have um an owl so there's um there's a darkness to her in addition to this primary goddess of fertility and love and abundance and you know much beloved goddess of these peoples <clears throat> the middle picture here we have inanna and um she is either sitting or has her one foot raised and standing on a lion so again we see this sort of dominant imagery with the goddess either standing atop a lion or um, subduing the lion you can see she appears to have um, a leash or a rope or a chain that she's holding the lion so she's holding it back with one hand and holding it down with a foot so very powerful sovereign strong strong victorious energy and ishtar inanna was definitely invoked for war and victory and domination among neighboring peoples so this third picture is um thought to be astarte or ashtart who is the um she is the canaanite please please forgive me if i'm off on that astarte was um Ph phoenician the phoenician um version of this goddess and ashtart was the um canaanite and she is holding a, a bowl of libation you can see that she has two crouching um sphinx like creatures so they're lions with human faces and wings 
which we'll see again um, in Anatolia. And in this particular figure, her head is the opening to a votive vessel. And when liquid would be poured in, it would be poured out of her breasts into the bowl. So definitely fertility aspects and this um, sense of the lions supporting her in her abundant nature. Okay, into Anatolia and Persia. So the earliest imagery of lions from this, um, from this area are from the very famous sites of uh, Katolhuyuk and Gobekli Tepe. On the left and the right flank, you'll see um, what appear to be lion sculptures from Gobekli Tepe. One of them is crouched and facing down on the pillar. And actually, you probably can't see it in the picture, but it looks like it's coming down to another creature that's a relief on the sculpture. So it may be actually coming hunting. And the pillar on the right, it's sort of this fierce, it's a male lion, but it's this fierce dominating rising up lion so sort of a um not yeah aggressive an aggressive stance so it seems like these ancient people so this era is like seven to eight thousand to even eleven thousand years ago um probably had a shamanic connection with the lion and developed their symbolic and um, archetypal relationship with the lion as this creature of dominance and power and strength and uh, a symbol of being able to attain resources so the lion would be able to always get its prey whatever it needed it could just conquer the figure in the middle this ancient what is thought to be a mother goddess was excavated in the site of Katalhoyuk in Turkey. And she is flanked by two feline creatures, potentially lionesses, potentially um, leopards, but definitely big cat energy. And it's just, it's very interesting that she is nude and in this very um prominent display of fertility so breasts stomach legs everything is is like very exposed and she is proudly sitting with her hands upon the backs of these lions so the lions are definitely there to support the abundant nature of the goddess so we've all heard of the lion's gate. The actual lion's gate in Hattusha, which was the capital of the Hittite empire, is um, a passageway in this ancient temple complex. And you can see there are two lions on either side of this passage. And on the right, you can see that it is, you know, in a position of roaring or pronouncing. So lions were guardians of the temple, symbols of the goddess and of divine ordinance. So you must be able to pass through the lions in order to gain access to this sacred area. And on the other side of this complex, um, above the lion's gate is the Sphinx gate, which is another very similar passageway but they're sphinxes instead of lions. So there's this sense of the lions being the more physical guardians of the sacred space. And then when you get to the Sphinx gate, there's this almost um, fantasy element of these hybrid creatures uh, with lion's bodies and wings and human faces. So it's it's like this, multiplicity of 
of protective, powerful, celestial energies that are guarding this sacred space. Um, Cosette had mentioned in her presentation, the Lion's Gate in Mycenae. So this picture is very interesting. I hope you can see it clearly. The two lions are actually um, raised up on either side of a pillar above the gate entrance to the city. It's thought that this pillar was actually representative of the goddess. And in many of these ancient cultures, before or concurrent with um, figurative representation, many of these goddesses were depicted as either stones, meteorites, or poles, sometimes stones, sometimes wood. So it's just very interesting to see another, um, another version of this with the goddess as this um, singular pole between the two lions. Now this is um, the Herosthesion uh, of Antiochus in Turkey. Oops, sorry. And this is um, an approximately first century BC um, temple complex and um, funerary monument of Antiochus the first, who was um, a leader of was king of the kingdom of Commagene, which was one of the various kingdoms under the Greek and Persian influence at the time. So he believed that he was descended from both Greeks, Persians, and Armenians at the time. And he created um, a row of the most important gods that were basically cross-cultural at that time. And these five figures were flanked on either side by lions and eagles, eagles also being um, symbols of kingship and power. So you can see on the left, we have one of the lions. The All of these are photos that I took from our trip last year. And in the middle, you can see the figure of Komajin. That's what they call her in Turkey. She is also thought to be Artemis or the Armenian Anahit, mother goddess and fertility goddess. This is um, a figure on the left side, we see the eagle and um, I believe the first, the first head is Antiochus himself followed by Anahit and then Armazd and Tyr and Vahan. In the second photo, you can see um, a recreation of what the statues and the monument would have looked like in its day. So these um, very regal figures flanked on either side by the eagle and the lion. And it's very possible that the eagle and lion were sort of heraldic beasts of the time representing the heritage that he believed himself to be from. So Anahit and Anahita. Anahit uh, was the Armenian mother goddess, Armenia being um, on the eastern half of what we now know as Turkey, and um, Persia being east and south of Armenia. They were, all of these um, ancient kingdoms were vying for power in the classical world. So Anahita, there is much more um, artifacts and art available describing her. There's more scholarship on her because Armenia is such, um, is at great disadvantage when it, uh, investigating their own history. There's very few actual remnants describing her. The goddess at Nemrut, whom they call Komajin, is one of the only representations we have of Anahit. 
but she was believed and described in a lot of the ancient literature as being throned and um, flanked by lions. So both Anahit and Anahita were flanked by lions and had um, a fiery aspect as well as a watery aspect. So in these images, you can see on the left side, she almost has that mistress of animals look with the two animals basically climbing her legs, but she's holding them in a passive stance. In the middle picture, we see again, the this mistress of animals kind of pose. The lions are holding, I believe their hairs, and she is, you know, with outstretched wings um, in a position of dominating these animals and the lions are supporting her with paws up. The third figure, um, Anahita is a water goddess, a fertility goddess, and a protector of women. Later, she is sometimes depicted as riding a tiger like Durga or a lion. A 4th century BC depiction of Anahita, radiant and mounted on a lion, being worshipped by uh, Artaxerxes II, uh, king of Persia from 404 BC. So I think here we're really seeing that um, solar archetypal resonance with Anahita and the fiery aspect. Anahita was... Um, one of the divine triad of Zoroastrianism, which was a fire religion at the beginning of the common era. Okay, I'm not going to talk, talk a whole lot about Egypt um, and North Africa because we covered a lot with our Sekhmet presentations, but I just wanted to show you some, some more imagery showing that solar archetypal kind of um, look. So the first picture, we have a goddess called Kadesh or Kadesh, who is sort of a mysterious goddess. Um, it's thought that she came from the east, either from Canaan or one of the other um, Mesopotamian cultures, and was sort of um, invited into the Egyptian pantheon. So she was a goddess of fertility and abundance, and um, I believe kingship, but not in the same way as like Inanna or Ishtar. So you can see she's standing um, upon a lion flanked on one side by Osiris and the other side. I'm not going to embarrass myself by getting it wrong, but one of the other gods. Um, in the middle, we have uh, two representations of Sekhmet, um, one with the solar disk above her head and holding a um, uh, palm or papyrus, papyrus um, stem. And the second one, she is seated with the solar disc broken off. And the solar disc also has the cobra um, at, the, at the brow. And same in the photo on the right, she's got um, a giant solar disc with the cobra, the eye of Ra. And then we have Bastet, the gentler, the kinder, gentler um, cousin of Sekhmet. So it's thought that initially Bastet was a lion goddess as well. And that over time, that Sekhmet energy split off into a more sort of rageful, patriarchal energy. And that Bastet morphed into a more maternal, nurturing kind of um, totemic goddess. So you can see though in the middle here, we have that Sekhmet um, figure with the solar disc and the cobra facing the same, the same um, profile of Bastet. And on the left, there's this um, like an amulet version of Bastet. Now we'll go a little bit further east in our journey today. So a goddess that we don't hear about very often um, is Nana. And she was primarily known in the area that was called Bactria, that's now Afghanistan, Afghanistan and Central Asia. So Nana is uh, 
is almost like a bridge between Inanna Ishtar and Durga. So there's definitely a progression of imagery from these different areas. You can see in the first photo, she's seated on her throne in a position that, that Rowan described with one foot sort of almost casually or lazily up and the other foot down on the earth. So there's this sense of her being both celestial and connected to the earth. The central um, image is on a silver plate from that same uh, era. And she has what appears to be a sun in one hand. She has four hands, actually. A sun raised up on one side and a crescent moon on the other, which again brings that celestial um, divine energy in. And she is seated directly on a lion who appears to be sort of subdued under her. So there's definitely this sense of, of power and um, domination and celestial authority. And on the right, we see another representation of her um, with her feet upon a lion, a resting lion. And now far east enough to see some representations of Durga. As I mentioned before, Durga was a goddess created specifically to fight evil and to fight demons in the world. So she is shown on the left here with one lion at her left and some sort of um, horned, um, not probably not a bull, but another, I don't know what they're called. But thank you. Of course you would know. <laughs> And she, in her various arms, has weapons and talismans um, to confer her power. In the center here, this is a little harder to see, but she's shown um, with two lions under her knees. She's seated upon, you know, a throne of some kind with um, these lions that almost look kind of crushed under her. So you really see the, the power and the control and the um, almost brute strength of this goddess in this image. And then at the right, of course, we have a more modern version of her where she's riding the lion and holding up in her, you know, in her eight arms, her different symbols and weapons. Okay, Greece and Rome. I know I need to like wrap it up here. We're getting yeah. close. Okay, Greece and Rome. We'll, we'll we'll power through this part. So Rhea Kibel Kibele is um, was a goddess of ecstatic um, power, rulership, mother goddess Mater Kubelea, which we will be um, honoring in our ritual tonight, and. This goddess, Kibele and Rhea, her sort of Western counterpart, really um, embody that sense of wildness and an inability to be tamed, almost a, a shamanic kind of ecstatic expression of goddess. Very protective, very powerful, very dominating. And in the center, we see um, another one of those seals that Cosette showed in her presentation of this sort of mistress of animals or priestess of uh, serpents flanked on either side by lions. So these lions are emblems of power, emblems of guardianship, protection, and that sort of sense of divine authority. And on the right, we have, again, Potniateran, the mistress of animals. Kibele, here we have some Greek and Roman depictions of her. Uh, the left one, very famous with her throne enthroned with the lions on either side. In the middle, this coin struck, um, she is enthroned with a lion um, under her throne or seat. And on the right, again, another depiction with her uh, flanked by these um, powerful maned lions. Now, Aphrodite is an interesting one. 
there are references to Aphrodite um, with lions, but they're very few and there are very little imagery. Again, sort of like in the Minoan culture, they're mostly on small items, maybe not seals, but coins and small items of decoration. So it almost seems like, like a really niche kind of depiction of Aphrodite that probably is evoking that sense, that archetypal sense of wildness and freedom and uh, an untamedness that um, was not widely displayed around because of the patriarchal nature of the Greek culture. So you can see here, she's um, seated on a lion in this gold um, piece of jewelry. And again, um, on the cameo, seated on the lion with Cupid in both depictions. And then Hecate. So again, like Aphrodite, there's not very many, um, if any, art artifacts showing Hecate with a lion. It's, it's sort of diffuse and more literary. In the left, we see um, a picture, a relief of Hecate with Kibele, who is seated with the lion at her feet. So there's sort of um, an adjacent nature. And since Hecate and Kibele were often conflated and or referenced together, we can kind of see where that leonine energy may have found its way into Hecate's cult. In the right side here, we have um, a gate at the temple of Legina, temple of Hecate at Legina, with, you can see a lion's head at the very top, sort of that same guardianship and uh, authority that we see in the temple spaces. And now more into the modern era. So there are many, many depictions of the Virgin Mary with a lot of different iconography, many different animals and symbols. There's a particular um, Gothic tradition in Eastern Europe of the Virgin Mary um, with lions. It's very, it's very specific. There's not a lot leading up to this or after it, but these uh, depictions, she's definitely shown in this sort of peaceful, languorous, almost relaxed position of standing on or lounging on lions. So I think once we get to this era, we're really see seeing this um, transformation of the goddess element from the lions being sort of her wild consort or an emblem of her um, divine, celestial, ferocious, um, uh, contradictory nature to here having this, this um, sort of docile mother standing over the lion almost as, as if she were the patriarchal depiction of that goddess in not in her freedom aspect or her ecstatic aspect as in Kibele, but as this mother of God and the docile, all nurturing mother. So just an interesting sort of transformation of that um, very pervasive iconography. And that is the end of my slideshow and I'm five minutes over. So I guess I should just sort of wrap up and say, I hope you enjoyed the art. <laughs> Thank you.